Good afternoon once again from Queen's School of Business and welcome to today's QSB Insight webinar, Lessons in Resilience, the Thermostat ver versus the Thermometer. Uh, I know everyone is here today to uh, listen to Dr. Peter Jensen. My name is Neil Beers and I'll be serving as moderator for today's session and I'm just going to cover off some of the early housekeeping slides as I know I've always already had some of these questions posed to me in the Q&A before we've begun. First off, today's session will be recorded. We record each and every one of our QSB Insight webinars, which we do run monthly, and each of those recordings is made available on the website, so qsbinsight.ca. Uh, you can also generally use the exact same link that you uh, used to register for the event to view the recording. And we should have that posted probably by Monday of next week, but we will let everybody know via email when that's ready to watch. And please feel free to share that recording with uh, any friends or colleagues that you think might find it valuable. Questions. Uh, we will, I'm, I'm sure as we have uh, such a large number of people registered today, we'll have a flood of questions. So please uh, feel free to ask those questions at any point during the session. If you save your question until the very end, um, you can understand how it might be a bit difficult to pull those out of the feed. So ask them whenever they come to mind. Use the chat window or the uh, Q&A panel on the right side of your screen to ask those. Please direct those questions to me and then uh, we'll conduct the Q&A as a, an interview style at the end of today's session. But again, please uh, don't hesitate to ask them at any point during today's uh, presentation. Without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Peter Jensen. He's an internationally recognized authority on high performance. Since achieving his PhD in sports psychology, he has attended eight Olympic Games as a member of the Canadian Olympic team and has worked with over 70 medal-winning athletes and coaches. He has been the mental training consultant for the past three gold medal-winning women's hockey, Olympic hockey teams, and he's the author of The Inside Edge, a book that describes how to improve both your personal and organizational performance under pressure, and Igniting the Third Factor, a book on how to inspire greatness in others. He's the founding partner of Performance Coaching Incorporated, a corporate training firm. He's been featured on many major media outlets, and he's also a uh, highly acclaimed speaker on many of our Queen School Business programs. And what you're going to see today is a, a bit of a sneak peek of the next book that he's working on, but I will let him get into all of those details. So with that, I uh, wish you a great session. I'm here for any technical support that you might need along the way. But with that, I'm going to pass things over to Dr. Peter Jensen. Very good. Thank you, Neil. I trust everybody can hear me. Um, yeah, you mentioned the book, Neil. I should say right at the outset that as you listen to this podcast, this uh, webinar, if you, uh, if you think of a really decent name for the book, feel free to let me know because the book is entirely written and I have yet to come up with a title that anybody can even begin to relate to. They don't seem to like my uh, thermostat versus a thermometer uh, outlook, so we can talk a little bit about that. All right, well, let's, let's get started. Um, I, I suppose the first thing we need to do is, is put this into perspective. And if you think about one of the key things in our society today, certainly in Canada, and, and the Bell Let's Talk series really emphasizes this a lot. They have some great ads right now on TV about that is the whole area of mental injury in the workplace and and the idea that you know we as as a people have to protect other people from uh, mental injury when they're working for us and, and if you think of this as an overlay because I like to think of healthy high performance and so when we're going to look at what we're doing today it's really about building resiliency and resiliency of course is related to health but if you think of the organization as the power plant, then you think of the leader as the surge protector. The leader is the individual who has to, at, at some point, protect the people under them. Yes, from physical injury, if they're in that kind of an environment, but also from mental injury. But then there's the individual themselves and the fact that they need to be, become more of a, a power converter. You know, if, if you look at what we do in sport, we turn pressure into growth and development. That, that's the whole idea behind it. And when I use the word resiliency and you think about resiliency, please don't think that you're learning to grow a thicker skin or put on a better suit of armor. Resiliency is about how quickly do you bounce back to your normal self, the way you normally are. A ball that's resilience regains its shape very, very quickly. And so that's the kind of resiliency we're talking about how quickly you get over adversity, how quickly you bounce back from failure and disappointment. Now, 
we're going to talk about something that grows out of the area of sports psychology today. Traditional psychology, as developed by Sigmund Freud, who you see on your left here, was designed to help people who were dysfunctional, who were not doing well in life. Sports psychology, on the other hand, was designed to help people excel, to exceed. And we, we came up with a content for sports psychology by examining people who were exceptional performers. The skier on your right is a man named Ingmar Stenmar, who was a very famous slalom skier from Sweden. Um, late in his career, for example, he only trained with two gates, despite the fact that there are numerous gates in a slalom course. And when they asked him about that, he said, there's a left turn and there's a right turn. The rest I can do inside my head. And so early performers like Stenmar and others, of course, started to teach us, Nicholas was another good example, the golfer Jack Nicholas, about imagery, about all kinds of different things that eventually came to make up what we now call mental fitness. This is a mental fitness model that we use in, in our small organization. And, and I, there's a lot of detail on there, and I don't want you to get hung up on the detail. We're going to talk about one aspect of mental fitness, which is really about being resilient uh, in a few minutes. But let me put this into perspective. Let's suppose this webinar was concerned with physical fitness. What would the content be like? Well, we've been talking about cardiovascular endurance, then we talk about power, then we talk about flexibility, and we might conclude by talking about strength. Well, what if we were going to encourage mental fitness? What would we talk about? Would we talk about people's perspective? We talk about the images they run. We talk about how to manage their energy. And we talk about where they put their attention. What do they focus on? Today, we're dealing with the extreme left in that model. We're going to talk about energy management. That does not mean these things aren't all connected. Of course, your perspective can easily undermine your energy. We're going to talk a little later about how we need to learn to minimize the drain on our energy resources by changing sometimes the way we think about ourselves. Now, you might be asking, okay, well, how does this work? Well, it works because you're a human being. Look at the next diagram. See in the middle it says self. If you were a snake or a lion or a manta ray, we'd be pulling that self out. Why? Because it wouldn't exist. And none of those primitive animals, more primitive animals than you or I, have awareness. You and I, you and I on the other hand, are blessed with awareness. We can notice what's going on at the mind level, the body level and the feeling level, and we can make choices. We don't have to be ruled by it. We don't have to be dominated by what we're experiencing at the mind, body, or feeling level. We are least human when we are like our more primitive counterparts, when we are reactive. We are most human when we notice what's, what's happening to us as a result of a certain situation and learn to make choices. And yes, sometimes we change our perspective and sometimes we change the images we're running or we choose to run new images that take a stand for what we want. Other times we'll breathe differently and lower our energy level. And sometimes we'll redirect our attention onto something more appropriate. But this is at the foundation of being mentally fit. Awareness is the key. Let's talk about why we would even want to talk about energy management. Well, the world we live in, there is a set amount of hours in every day that has not changed. And yet the sheer volume of demands that we face as professionals or parents or students has grown exponentially. Now, people who fail to identify the constant <laughs> term in that above equation that I just mentioned, the number of hours in a day hasn't changed, mistakenly term to time management strategies in the hopes of keeping up with a growing list of to-dos. The challenge with this approach is that time is finite. And even when we think we're using it wisely, often it's time that has control over us. If you think about it, it's the pressure of time that, have us, that has us sometimes forfeiting a, a well-needed night's sleep, for example. 
it's the urgency of time that creates a wave of anxiety in us when we think, oh my gosh, I gotta do this or I gotta do that. And of course, it's the limits of time that force us into thinking we don't have enough of it, especially to spend with the loved ones or the places we want to spend our time. The truth is, time is the problem. It's not the solution. Now, when you focus on energy management, on the other hand, that's always within our own control. And it's about striking a balance between moments of high performance and periods of renewal. You know, often we describe our days as a marathon. Oh, it's such a marathon. The truth is, from an energy perspective, we are not marathoners. We are all sprinters. We all work best when we work for a hard, for a period of time, like 90 minutes at the most, 120 minutes, and then we put in some time for recovery. And we're going to talk about that a little later on and why that's so critical. But coming back to energy management, getting enough rest and recovery, leveraging our stressors, and enjoying the presence of loved one, these are actually positive actions that are connected to energy management. These are actions that serve to increase our overall level of productivity at a much greater rate than spending a couple of extra hours working in a disengaged state on something. And so here's the metaphor that I have been uh, putting forward. You are a thermostat, ideally, not a thermometer. What does a thermometer do? Well, it rises or lowers itself to the temperature in its immediate environment. It matches the environment it finds itself in. A thermostat, on the other hand, you set. You decide what level of arousal that you want to be at. And we're going to see that particularly in high performance situations, this is absolutely critical. In my work with elite athletes, I would say that learning to monitor and control your arousal level is the single most important thing they do to be able to get out all their skills at crucial times. And we're gonna look at the choker's profile and on all of these kinds of things so that we get a better understanding of what I have just said. But why don't we start at the beginning? And the beginning is you gotta acquire energy in the first place. You know, right now it's quite cold outside, at least where I am, and as a result, my furnace is on. But I don't have to worry about the energy supply to my furnace. However much energy I need simply is piped in from a gas pipeline. That's not true of me as a human being. I have to put energy or things into my body that create energy for me. And we'll talk about those very, very briefly. Then we're gonna talk about the raising and lowering of energy that I just referred to when we have a section called monitoring your arousal level. And then we're gonna look at minimizing the drain. You know, in my house, I had an energy audit done in my house because there were certain things in my house that were not conducive to good energy management. I was losing a lot of heat along my sill plate, for example. I needed to increase the insulation behind uh, certain light switches and sockets, and I had to replace some windows. And mainly to get my kids to stop leaving the fridge door open, leaving lights on in rooms, etc. Well, we as a human being need to learn how to minimize the drain on our energy as well. <clears throat> and then something I call an energy reset, which we will get to a little later. So let's talk about acquiring energy first and foremost. Sleep is essential, all right? And there's a ton of information on sleep. Now, as a great irony, I literally have come to you from a sleep lab. <laughs> uh, last night, I spent with wires over my entire body in a sleep lab because I have sleep apnea. Despite the fact that I'm 6'3 and weigh 155 pounds and as skinny as a rail, for some unknown reason, I have sleep apnea. I was exhausted for uh, years not realizing I had sleep apnea. The minute I got a CPAP machine, my energy levels doubled. <clears throat> Made all the difference in the world to me. I need a new machine, the government wants you to go and have another sleep test. So that's what I did last night. So nothing replaces sleep. We need to acquire energy. Now there's two other things. Oh, I wanna show you this little slide that I stole from uh, someone at Queens. <laughs> this is a, it was a great article in um, Wall Street, Wall Street Journal about six months ago about interns at some of the major banks in New York and how they seem to take more toilet breaks than anyone else 
Well, the long hours they were working were forcing them to catch up their, in the sleep in the toiletry, in the laboratories. And so they created a term for it called toilet napping. And it's quite interesting because when you look at how the, the banks have reacted to this, you know, they've decided, for example, that interns deserve two days a weekend off. Two days, two weekend days off a month. Oh my goodness, say hey, what a break. However, for the rest of us, uh, let's hope we're not working on those kind of schedules. But we need to get enough sleep. I had um, uh, one of the students I used to do the research for the book, a Queen's Commerce student, uh, look into, okay, what's the optimal level for a nap? Like everybody says they would be more productive if they had a nap in the afternoon. What's the optimal time? And it really ties in with a sleep cycle. You know, when you sleep, sleep occurs over a 90-minute cycle. And, and it's a funny sort of thing, you know, if you're tired in the morning when you get up, it does not necessarily mean you didn't get enough sleep. It might mean you woke up in the middle of a sleep cycle where you were in slow, uh, deep sleep, slow wave deep sleep. And that's why you feel tired. You're only going to know in the middle of the afternoon whether you actually got enough rest or not. And so what this chart tells us is, first of all, ideally it's great if you work, wake up at the end of a 90-minute sleep cycle. Now that may sound to you like, well, how do, you, how do you do that? I bought a little app for my phone. Now it's really expensive, it's 99 cents, and it's called 24-7 something, but you just go online, you'll find all kinds of them. And um, you put it in your bed, and what it does is you can set the alarm, and it wakes you up, let's say you set the alarm for 6.30. Well, it'll wake you up 10 minutes either side of that when it's most appropriate, or right at 6.30 if that's the, that happens to coincide with the end of your sleep cycle. It monitors you, and it'll tell you how much rest you got, how much how restless you were, how much you were awake, et cetera. It's, it's really quite an interesting little app for such an inexpensive thing. So what this says is if you're going to take a nap, ideally somewhere around 20 minutes is about as far as you want to go, or once you get into that deep sleep, you're not going to feel as rested and recovered as you would like to feel. These are sleep pods, this next slide. And uh, it's interesting, uh, um, in writing this book, I had to go down to a radio station because part of the book is set in a radio station. But it's, the main character goes into an open line radio show. It's, the book is written as a novel uh, along the lines of the wealthy barber. So you learn the information by enjoying the story. and. Um, and in Chorus Entertainment here in Toronto, they actually have some areas where employees can go and take and crash for 20 minutes. And you know, it's interesting to think about this, of course, because cultures had this for years and years and years. We just don't have it anymore. And it was called a siesta. But these are some examples of the sleep pods that some companies are starting to put in. I was just at the World Championships in the fall uh, for women's basketball in Turkey. I work with the Canadian team. We had a great tournament, by the way. We went from ninth in the world to fifth, which is quite astounding uh, for us. And, and one of the players on the team is a runner, you know, and she kept saying to me, oh, I got to get out for a run. I got to get out for a run. And I'd say, why? I mean, we've got basketball games. You got the, yeah, I know, but, you know, runners hate to take time off running. They really do. So finally I said to her one day, when do you think you get fit? She paused and looked at me sort of funny. She said, what do you mean? I said, when do you actually get fit? She said, when I work out. I said, no, you don't get fit when you work out. Nobody gets fit when they work out. You lift weights, you know when you get fit? When you're sleeping, that's when you get fit. That's when the body repairs all the little muscle tears and things. So if you're not getting adequate rest, you're not taking advantage of your fitness program. Now, the fitness slide is in here because that's another way to energize. That's another way for us to increase our level of energy. Someone who is in shape has a lot higher levels of energy than someone who is not. And it's interesting, you know, working with bridge players and chess players and activities that you would say, well, fitness is not important to those activities, they're all getting in shape now. There's no more big, heavy uh, bridge players and people like that, not at the world-class level a anyway, and certainly not too on the golf course anymore either. And, and, and the other thing, of course, is what you eat. And that's, it's not the purpose of this seminar to talk about that, but obviously the nutrition you take in also determines how much energy you have. All right, let's move and look at, we're not gonna do this little game. Uh, that, that's something I do when I have a class uh, live in front of me. Let's talk about turning your thermostat down, okay? Now, here's the interesting thing. A while ago, 
when I first introduced this, I talked about the self and mind-body feelings. And I said that one of the things that a human being is capable of doing is stepping back and noticing how they're feeling, what they're thinking, their heart rate, their respiration rate, the pain in their knee, et cetera. We can observe these three things so they are not who we are. They're actually what's happening to us. They're not who we are. And that's an important distinction. You know, we talk about self-awareness and self-responsibility and self-control, but if you think about it for a minute, those are actually inaccurate, those expressions. It is the self that does the awareness. It is the self that does the direction or the controlling part. You have a place where you can go and notice what is happening to you, and then you can make choices. Now, sometimes what happens is we start to talk to ourselves differently. Uh-oh, don't think this meeting is going to go very well. Or, oh, my gosh, I don't – like. I just don't have enough time to get this done. The minute you start to talk like that, what happens to your feelings? They start to change. They start to change. Then the body starts to tighten up, and suddenly we're totally out of whack. Now, in sport, we have a name for this. We call it choking. You choke when your arousal level gets too high and you miss critical information and you don't perform very well. Let's take a look at what happens. Stick with me on this. This is a really simple concept. Don't let the diagram throw you off. It just takes a minute to explain it, that's all. Across the top is an arousal level scale, an energy scale. Zero, you're totally relaxed. If you die, it's just a formality. Then you wing your way along to a 10, and at a 10, and this is very scientific, you have a five-foot flame going out your back end. Have you got the scale? Now, look what happens to your attentional focus, and it is represented by those two narrow lines that are narrowing down. And you can see that the number of things that you can pay attention to when your arousal level is at a 9 or a 10 is minimal when compared with a 1 or a 2. Now, I've drawn a, drawn a line in this chart, uh, just a hypothetical line, uh, uh, not a hypothetical line, it's a real line. but for a hypothetical situation. So let's assume that someone is new at something and they're learning it. So let, let's take someone, uh, let's take a young child learning to ride a two-wheel bicycle. Well, you think of that, that line, what's it made up of? They gotta pay attention to balance. They gotta pay attention to steering. They gotta pay attention to pedaling. And there's a lot that they have to pay attention to. And as long as that line is inside the boundaries, they will focus on everything. And the interesting thing is, that line will not always be that long. Let's look at an expert cyclist on the next one. Oh my goodness. She doesn't take much attention to cycle. Why is that? Because the skill is automatic. She's overlearned it to the point where she doesn't even have to think about it. Of course, in sport, we do this all the time. This is why world records get broken. People can take higher and higher arousal levels into an activity that you and I can't. A professional golfer can take a lot more energy into the golf swing than you and I can. Why? Because the skill is much more automatic. It's much more well-learned. It does not require as much attention. Now, here's the performance problem I was telling you about. It's when the arousal level gets too high, either because of the complexity of what we're trying to do. It's just a very difficult thing. We're chairing a meeting on sexual harassment, or we're new at it. We, we're not that skilled yet. And in this diagram, what you can see is that when we get under the number seven, which is where the person's arousal level is, you'll see that they miss relevant information. Critical information falls outside of their attentional focus. They don't have access to it. Now, of course, you've all had this experience. We've all been in a meeting or an interaction with a group of people where we go in and we're expecting a certain thing and it doesn't happen. And, and someone challenges us, and we don't notice that our face gets red. We don't notice our arms cross. Those would be body-level things. We don't notice what we're saying to ourselves. That would be the mind-level thing. I can't believe this. This isn't fair, whatever. And we also may not notice the feelings that are generated in us. But the feelings could be anger, frustrated, nervous, anxious, worried, or any combination of them. And you see, when we don't notice those things, you know what happens? We become them, and they control us, and they dominate us, 
And what happens in those situations? We leave the meeting and 10 minutes later, we're saying, oh my gosh, when he said that, why didn't I say this? And I forgot to mention this, this, and this. If we can think of it 10 minutes later, how come we couldn't think of it when we were right in front of the other person? Well, we chose. Our arousal level got too high, our focus got too narrow, and we missed really important information. So what are you gonna do about this? Well, the medical people, emergency workers, for example, they have a very systematic way of dealing with this stuff. To overprotect themselves from the high stress situation, they have made what they do automatic. Airways, breathing, circulation. They arrive on the scene, they stick to that format. They check airways first, then breathing, then circulation. Okay? So what's our little template that we use when we get in to tough situations? Well, we would have techniques that come from a variety of areas. Some of the techniques would be breathing techniques. If I had more time, I would love to stop and teach you the centering technique. But what I will have Neil do is I will have Neil put a full description of it online so you can practice it. It's not very difficult, but my gosh, can you ever drop your arousal level quickly with a really good breathing technique? Uh, one of the figure skaters I worked with for years, a man named Elvis Stoiko, could lower his resting heart rate about 50 beats in two breaths. And there would be other skills like reframing, changing the way you look at something, talking to yourself, affirming yourself, acting as if, that's a critical skill as well. Act as if you have time when you feel under pressure, etc. But these would go into being part of your energy management plan to lower your arousal level when you find it too high. So let's talk about breathing, first of all. Now this is the Japanese team at the World Championship. And moments earlier, they were the noisiest people in the gym running around, cheering just so full of energy. And about five minutes before the game was gonna start, uh, we played them in Ankara, Turkey. Uh, they immediately stopped, they all stopped, and they all walked into this formation, and they closed their eyes, and they centered. They stopped and, and centered. Not that it was all that effective, we beat the crap out of them anyway, but, but we'll come back to that. Um, here is a world expert in breathing, right here. Yeah, babies. Any of you who have ever had a young child, uh, you know, a son or a daughter, you know only too well what I'm talking about. You watch a baby asleep on its back and one thing and only one thing moves. That's right, the midsection goes up and down, up and down. Why is that? Because babies know how to breathe. They breathe from the diaphragm, the muscle we were intended to breathe from. Most of us breathe way too high in our chest. And it really becomes for us a gas issue. That's correct, a gas issue. You know, carbon dioxide, CO2, has always been painted as the villain and oxygen as the hero, the white hat and the black hat. But the fact of the matter is you need a balance between these two glasses, uh, gases. If you have too much oxygen, you're breathing too high in your chest, you almost get giddy. You know, you, you, you almost get into that hyperventilation state where you're not stable. Uh, uh, the carbon dioxide is almost like a tranquilizer. It's essential. It's part of it. So I am going to do one very small thing with you right now. Wherever you are, whether you're sitting or standing, I suspect most of you are sitting, would you just take one of your hands and put it on your upper chest right now, just below your neck, just below the shoulder blades, right, on the front of your chest, right on your sternum, and take your second hand, and I want you to find your rib cage, the bottom of your rib cage, and now put your hand there because just under the rib cage, uh, not physically under it, below it, that would be a better way to put it, um, and that's your diaphragm muscle. And just in quiet now, over the next 30 seconds, I just want you to notice which hand comes out first. And of course, it should be the bottom hand. All right, thank you for doing that. And so this is a miniature version of the centering technique. Um, I will send Neil a more detailed version, but basically this is the way it works. 
you focus 100% of your attention on your diaphragm when you inhale. Then you hold the air for a second. And when you let it out, you shift your attention to your shoulders and you let them fall. And if you're standing, you bend your knees. Or if you're sitting, your rear end sinks into the chair. Now, I know this sounds really simple. You get good at this, you'll be astounded how quickly you can lower your arousal level. It's an incredibly effective skill. It comes from Aikido, uh, one of the martial arts. And you know the great thing about it? You know the wonderful thing about breathing techniques? You can practice them anywhere. Nobody knows you're doing them. Okay? You're stuck in traffic, you've got two choices. Learn to fly or breathe. So instead of getting out of joint, great time to practice your breathing technique. You're waiting for that download bar on your computer rather than sitting there going, come on, what's taking so long? Jesus, the internet is slow. Send her. The best teachers for me, I have decided, bear in mind that I'm 68 years of age, so this is not an insult to anybody, but I have decided that all the senior citizens in any express lane have been sent to teach me how to breathe. I had a beauty the other day over at Metro here in Don Mills. The guy was searching for coupons in his pocket, and I'm in the express lane. He was a master teacher. I would have got so at a joint years ago, I sat there and centered three or four times, got control of myself, and went home in a much better state than I would have a few years ago, I can tell you. Become a Taoist. You know, when you start to act like you have time and walk like you have time and talk like you have time, an interesting thing happens. You start to get time. See, there's two dimensions to time. There's the clock that you can see here. Yeah, the clock on the wall, that's one form of time. That's chronological time, but there's also psychological time. I had someone put it this way years ago. The length of a minute depends on which side of the bathroom door you're on. <laughs> that's right. You're on the wrong side of that door. A minute seems to take forever. <laughs> and so whenever I feel rushed now, I intentionally slow down. And you know what? I get more done. I know it's it's a strange thing, but it's actually true. And if you think about it, acting as if is important anyway. I mean, how many things have you acquired by acting as if? Almost all of us got our confidence by acting as if we were confident. We certainly didn't feel confident in the first place, but we chose to take a stand for the way we wanted to be. So slow things down. Now, sometimes you have to turn the thermostat up. You need energy. Have you, have you ever had that? place, you know, like it's, it's almost this time, actually. It's like 2, 2.30 in the afternoon, and you're sitting at your workstation or your desk, and you're looking around, and, and you're almost thinking like this, like, how could one organization have hired so many slugs, you're saying to yourself, you know? Or, or you're saying something like this to yourself, oh, my God, I got to get to bed at a decent hour tonight, you know? And the telephone rings. And on the other end of the phone, is someone who brings out the best in you. You haven't seen them in a while, they're in town, let's get together, we're gonna to do this, we're gonna do that. You hang up the phone, tell me about your energy level now. Totally different place, isn't it? You've been energized. Now this points out one critical thing. If you can get people to phone you at crucial points in your life, but maybe we have to learn to phone ourselves. Because you see, when we are disengaged like this, we are distracted. That's why we notice the other people in the office. We try to get at things we can't. We're too broad. We're not engaged enough. I read a book, Happy Money, a while ago. It's a really interesting book, by the way, um, by a woman from UBC and a guy from Harvard. And they, and they were talking about how any time spent focused on, on a single item is so important because it generates way more happiness, even if it isn't a pleasant task, than focusing on a variety of things. At the bottom of this slide, you can see a little quote from my friend Andy Higgins. Focusing on everything is focusing on nothing. And so what are you going to do to revitalize? You want to sharpen the saw. You know, you don't keep cutting wood with a dull saw. Every once in a while, you have to pull a saw out of the wood and sharpen the blade. Well, we need to do that for ourselves. And so what do we need to do? We need to break our day up. Okay? The whole issue of glucose and working memory, you know, it's an interesting thing is, glucose is the primary source for the body cells, including the brain. And when that becomes depleted, you continually exert effort on difficult thinking and reasoning when you're in that state, it really affects your potential. 
There's a woman named C.N. Bellick, and she wrote a book called Choke. She's a brain researcher at the University of Illinois. And she was just um, at a workshop uh, that I was doing with uh, the Olympic Preparation Workshop Series, getting ready, getting people ready for uh, for the Olympics in Rio. And she came up and spoke, and she, and she made an interesting point. She said, she said that operating uh, when all the glucose cylinders are empty is a really bad option, especially for people who have the most cognitive horsepower, with the most potential to begin with. And that's sort of interesting because, and I know this is just circumstantial evidence, but when you read the biographies of any of the, like whether it's Edison or Einstein or Madame Curie or whoever it happens to be, you know what you're going to discover? They took lots of naps. And because of who you are, we want to get things done, we tend to get engaged, you got to pre-plan those breaks. And you got to eliminate the things that are eating your energy away. And we'll talk about those. So. This is the point I made earlier, but I didn't make it this well. Staying focused on the present moment is beneficial for happiness. In fact, regardless of whether an activity is pleasant or unpleasant, people are happiest when they stay focused on it. And of course, there's tons of things on mindfulness right now that would fall right into this. So Tony Schwartz wrote a book um, called The Power of Full Engagement with uh, James Lohr, an American sports psychologist. And this is his point. You know. You got to get disciplined about breaks and you got to take one every 90 to 120 minutes. And take a break that meets one of the basic human needs. So if you're working intellectually on something, don't make your break doing something else intellectual. Go for a walk in the park next door. Uh, uh, phone your mother who, uh, who you're supposed to, is supposed to hear from you every so often anyway. That'll, that'll satisfy an emotional need. Those types of things. Now, what people will tell me, of course, is that they can't take breaks. No, are you kidding me? Take a break every 90 minutes? I can't do that, okay? And it's because we think too big or we think we don't have the time. We think, you know, a break has to be much longer. It doesn't. In five or 10 minutes, it's amazing how the body recharges. And yet, people will say, I can't do this. Now, there's a very simple solution to this if you don't, don't feel that you can take a break every day. And here's the solution. Take up smoking. It's amazing. Smokers have no trouble getting outside every 90 minutes or so. No trouble at all. So what about the rest of us? So I encourage you to take up smoking and do everything but the smoking part. Get outside, go for a bit of a walk, etc. Time spent outside is way more energizing than time spent inside. And we could get into a big philosophical, spiritual discussion on this because the soul loves beauty and it loves being outdoors, etc. And, and it, it, it's amazing what a difference five or 10 minutes just walking around outdoors will make to your, your energy level. Cultural norms. You know, I've talked to a lot of people who worked uh, more in, in Asia and the Far East, and, and they tell me they had no trouble taking breaks in the afternoon. They could even nap if they wanted to at their desk. It was culturally acceptable. You know, here, it's not so acceptable. And the last point here is, hey, when you do take a break, make sure it's a break. Don't hang out with a black hole in the office. Don't hang out with that person that only sucks energy out of the system, never puts any energy into the system. And of course, then the big stuff. Where are you going? What are you here to do? What's your purpose? You know, I, I love the ancient Egyptians. Uh, one of their expressions was, uh, you know, that when you died, you'd be asked two questions. Did you bring joy and did you find joy? Well, what are you here to bring and what are you here to find? And, and put those things into your day-to-day. -day. It's amazing how much energy you get, and especially when you do things for other people. You know, in Happy Money, they talk about giving someone $20, and some people, they say, spend it on yourself, and other people say, Space, spend it on other people. And the people who spend it on other people, their happiness lasts longer and is much deeper than people who spend it on themselves. Minimizing the drain. Ceaseless driving is acting when no amount of effort can make a difference. Imagine if I insisted that every single one of you change what you had for breakfast this morning. You'd say, Jensen, give me a break. I can't change. No amount of effort. That's correct. That's ceaseless driving. You're busy applying effort, and no amount of effort is going to change. It's, it's like you're stuck in a country and western song. It's sort of in there with the stand by your man crap, you know? And it's critical to be able to learn to let go. 
you know, what, what situation mastery? Acting when you can make a difference and letting go when you cannot. And if you can't sort out the things that you have control over from the things you do not have control over, you're in for a long, hard life. The second thing that can drain our energy is the stories we tell ourselves. We are constantly telling ourselves stories, and most of it is crap. I'm serious when I say that, you know? Too many times people think that the voice in their head is like God talking to them or something. The critic has almost no value, almost no value. Most of the time, it has no value whatsoever. The voice in your head is a young voice. The voice that's worried about this presentation or whatever, yeah, that's a young voice from a time when you were worried for a reason because you were uncertain in the world. But nothing of a death and life nature is going to happen in that meeting or in that presentation or with this golf swing. And, and the problem with the stories we tell ourselves is not so much the stories, but what they create in us. You see, we, it works in layers. We have the stories we tell ourselves, then the parts of the stories we imagine. And the minute you start to imagine something, what happens? The minute imagery comes into it, I can tell you what happens. Your feelings come. If you're alone late at night in the house and you start to imagine what might happen to you, do your feelings change? Oh my goodness, huge. The language of the body is imagery. And as far as the body is concerned, images are events. And so it reacts to them the way it reacts to events. And so now you've got these layers going. You got what you're telling yourself, what you're imagining. Now you got the feelings, but here's the good news. Under every single emotion is the energy to transform, the energy to move forward. I don't care whether the emotion is fear or shame or sorrow or excited competitiveness, angry. It's always got energy under it. And putting that energy into something productive and moving forward, deciding where you want to put that is critical. I'm often saying to performers, what are you gonna do with that disappointment? What's the setback teaching you? It's teaching you that you're not there yet. It's not teaching you you're not going to get there. It's just saying you've got something to learn or change or adjust or modify or improve or let go of. Because if you had what it took, you wouldn't have the setback in the first place. Most of life's lessons are not friendly. And how we talk to ourselves is critical. We're going to move into the end here. We're going to talk a little bit about our perception of stress. In order to do that, I'm going to talk about some research from Kelly McGonigal. And by the way, you go online and look at her uh, YouTube on, uh, TED Talk on this. It's really good. Here's her point. She said for years and years, she misinformed people about stress. It was to be avoided at all costs, et cetera, et cetera. She said, I gave people the wrong advice for years. It's not stress that kills you. It's your perception of stress. When you change your mind about stress, you can change your body's response to stress. And they've done some very interesting longitudinal studies on this where people who see stress as producing strength and growth in them don't get anywhere near the blockages in artery, all the kinds of stuff that come from people who see stress as stressful, as, as something, oh my goodness, this is not good for me. And they've looked at death rates over a period of time in hundreds of thousands of people and, and seeing massive differences. Uh, and, and it's the perception that you take to stress. And, and I want to finish by telling you a story about this. So I'm down in um, Houston, and I'm doing a presentation for Agrium, a big uh, fertilizing company out of Saskatchewan. Excuse me, just need a little water there. And uh, I finish, and Larry's from Texas. And uh, agrium's all over the states. Anywhere where there's farming, you'll find agrium. And so uh, Larry comes up to me, and, and he says, yeah, he said, that's really interesting what you were talking about. He said, you know, I, um, I have this young man I'm working with, and uh, we're hoping he's going to get a basketball scholarship. He's a very, very good high school basketball player. I'm mentoring him. I've uh, been mentoring him for a while. He doesn't have a dad. And... Uh, you know, he comes to see me, and he's always going on about what stress he's under and how much pressure. He's keep, he keeps talking to me about pressure. I'm under so much pressure, Larry. I don't have a dad. My mom works so long. i got to go home and make my own meals, and da 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 da, da. And, and finally, Larry says, you know, one day when he's coming over, Larry's got a nice big home. with a back. He's got a basketball court in his backyard. And so Larry takes him out back for his basketball and figured, you know, I'm going to talk to this kid. 
shooting hoops with him, just have a chat with him. Larry's about 60, 65 years of age. And uh, so he walks out back and he says to the kid, kids start talking about pressure again. Larry said, I was all ready for it this time. He said, uh, I said to the young boy, you know, I lost my father when I was 13. I didn't have a dad either, but let's talk a little bit about pressure. So he says to the kid, he, he picks up a, a basketball and uh, it's a properly inflated basketball. It's a brand new ball. And he bounces it over to the kid and he said, we're going to shoot some hoops. How will that work? The kid bounces the ball and says, no, Larry, this is a good ball. It's fine. It's going to work fine. Is that right? Larry says. So he, uh, says he reaches in his pocket, he's got an old ball there, and he, uh, he punctures the ball with a pen knife, and he flops the ball over to the kid. And he said, what about, oh, the guy starts laughing. He says, Larry, that one's not going to work. Larry said, yeah, why not? And the kid said, because there's no pressure in the ball. That's right, Larry said. No pressure, no bounce. It's the pressure that gives you your bounce. It's the pressure that gives you the energy that you need to do certain things. You know, I was in Montreal on uh, Tuesday speaking with um, a pharmaceutical company, and um, uh, one of the athletes I used to work with is now a mom, young mom, uh, expecting another baby, and uh, she's a mogul skier named Jennifer Heil, who won a gold medal in Torino and a silver medal in Vancouver. And I remember when I first started working with her, and we were laughing about this story, I, I said to her, uh, do you remember the Sunday I met home with my wife in Toronto, and the phone rings? And it's Jennifer. And I said, where are you? You're supposed to be in Japan. And she said, I am in Japan. I said, where are you? Are you? I'm on top of the mountain. Oh, well, did you qualify for the final? Yes. Yeah, she says, I did. I said, oh, when are you skiing? She said last, which means she qualified first. She was defending world champion. Good skier. So anyway, uh, I said, so what's the problem? She said, Peter, I got to ski in 20 minutes and it still doesn't feel any better. My stomach's still a mess with butterflies. I, I thought these things would go away if we started working. <laughs> and I started laughing on the Toronto end of the phone saying to her, Jennifer, you know, you need those butterflies and you need them big time because those are the energy that, that's the energy that's going to get you through that mogul run. But you have to do what Jack Donahue, our national basketball coach, used to say years ago. You got to teach your butterflies to fly information. You got to get that energy working for you. You got to put it into productive things, not worrying about the run, but rather focusing on what you want to do in the run. You know, I'm reminded of Hugh Downs, uh, a famous American broadcaster once said, and I thought this was a pretty darn decent summary of performance. He said, focus on what you're doing, not how you're doing. And on that note, Neil, I think we will open up to the two questions that you have received. Or maybe three. Or maybe 300. So we're going to do our best to uh, to get to a number of them. I know they're still flowing in here. Um, so to start things off, uh, this came in fairly early on. But um, so the advice of act, health, act healthy and feel better assumes ideal conditions. How do you deal with a situation where you might have a bully of a boss who is the one that's inducing all the stress that's then impacting your sleep and things feel a little bit out of your control? This is going to sound like a, um, a very cruel uh, answer, perhaps, but you have to decide whether that's an environment that you want to stay in and is worth working in. And, you know, people will say to me, well, I got to have a job. I got to this. I got to that. I said, really? If tomorrow you came down with a serious health ailment, you would make that decision in a moment. Why would it take something like that to force you to make a decision that you should learn to make? Obviously, you know, working for a bully, uh, that's what the whole mental injury in the workplace is all about. That, that person needs to be reported. The minute you go and say, this person is bullying me or this person is, is singling me out or I feel this way when I'm with this person, HR has to act on that. And I know this from fact because we had just a situation in an organization I was in a year and a half ago. I reported the incident and eventually uh, that other person was let go. Now, I'm not saying that will be the case in this situation, but you don't have to put up with that. And uh, this is either a place where you, you make a decision to act on your own behalf, because if they're being that way with you, chances are they're being that way with other people, and someone ought to stand up, uh, just the way people are now standing up against certain Bill Cosbys and people in our world that uh, acted in certain ways. 
or you're going to have to become an absolute Buddhist monk that can handle all this sort of stuff and you see this person as your teacher. And that's not beyond the realm either. I know people who do that and, and, and choose to work hard to not let this person have an impact on him. But that's a very tough, long road. All right, uh, next question. Um, so all of these details when presented in a whole package like this, they look like an amazing complete life overhaul. Uh, some of us might want to start with a tune-up rather than you know taking out the engine and starting all over again. So to start small, what is one change that you would recommend that somebody could take either today or tomorrow to gain a little bit more momentum into this uh, overall change process? You know, thank you so much, whoever asked that question. That's such a good question. Um, okay, here, I would ask you a question if you, were, um, if you were right in front of me. I would say to you, what is the one thing that if you did it would make all the difference in the world to your energy right now? And then that's where I would go and act. And for some people that will be taking a break during the day. For other people it will be getting more sleep at night. For somebody else it might be eating differently. For another person that might be saying, you know what, we got an EAP program here in our company. I am so hard on myself, I gotta go talk to people who have better roadmaps than I have on how to deal with this. But you're quite right. I mean, the, the thing I liked about that question is you already got it. You already understand that you start by doing one thing. You don't start by doing 10 things. Most often people try to change too many things at once. Pick one thing, it's Andy Higgins. Focusing on everything is focusing on nothing. Okay, uh, another one, another question just came in. Are you sure that was uh, okay, Neil? Yeah, I think, I think it was great. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. <laughs> another question Go just ahead. came in, uh, sort of the opposite side of the coin. My yeah. problem is the inability to get stressed. I'm extremely laid back. Do you have any pointers for me? Well, I wouldn't want you to get stressed. You might want to come up with things that engage you more. Um, you know, sometimes people think, you know, that we used to have people write an instrument called a stress map, and there was 21 scales on it, and, 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 and somebody, would, somebody would say, well, look at my stress map, I'm perfect, like I'm an optimal across all 21 scales. And, and I'd say to them, you know what, there's no way in your life you're being challenged. You're bored stiff with life. You're going through life like Muzak, you know? And, and as a result, you're not engaged, and so, I would say to this person, what excites you? And that might be, maybe you're flat because you're not engaged with enough people. Like you're, you know, getting, going out and, and passing information on to people or helping other people or doing something to, to assist another person in, 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 in doing something. Or maybe you're in the wrong job and it's getting too easy for you and you need something to challenge you. But I wouldn't use the word stress. I would say, how do you get more engaged? And again, that sort of needs to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation because it could be a variety of reasons. Okay, uh, another question just came in. Uh, so I manage a large group of physicians. How do I coach them to manage? <laughs> How do I coach them to manage the stress of being on call, an environment where they have little control over when they'll be called in and how urgent the situation might be? This is my family, all right? I, I have a daughter who is a medical doctor and an emergency medical doctor and family practice and second call and first call, and she has the added stress of organizing the schedule for all the physicians in her hospital because she's the CMO, the chief medical officer. And yeah, it, it, it's, that's a toughie. And what I would say is I would be more facilitative with that group as a whole, you know, I would, it, it, there will be some people in that group who manage things incredibly well and others who don't because some people are good with uncertainty and other people are not so good. And the trouble is, you know, especially if you're a male, you know, you have a great tendency to ask your neighbor if you're framing a doorway to give you a, some help because you don't know what you're doing. But in terms of uh, anything to do with yourself, like, you know, this stresses me out, we never talk to anybody else about it. And I would, I would want them to sit down and come up with a plan as a group. Like what's, what kinds of things can we do to make this more predictable, to better handle what we're going through? So some of the things would be things that they were doing, like inner skills that they were applying, and some of them will already be doing this. 
the, the funny thing about what people do on the inside is they think, oh, well, everybody else does this. No, no, everybody else already knows how to do this. No, they don't. No, they don't. Uh, you know, I, I remember working with a group of um, primarily women who were working with abused women um, many years ago, and they were all counselors. And, uh, and, and the one woman talked about uh, how, you know, when she had two doors to her office, one where people came in and then they left through a separate door because they were often distraught and they just didn't want to walk through a waiting room and see a bunch of people. And, uh, and the one woman had come up with a way of dealing with this. And what, what she did was when, when, the, when the woman walked through the door, she always imagined that she was carrying with her a ball, and just a balloon-sized ball. And, and she said that was her world. She said, I saw that as her world. And she was going to put that ball on the table, and we were going to open it up, and we are going to take a bunch of things out. And uh, we are going to talk about what was going on within her world. But with about 20 minutes to go in my hour, she said, I always was aware of how many things were sitting on the table uh, that we had talked about. And so I'd always summarize, well, you know, we talked about this today around that thing. Let's, let's put that back into your ball. And, and she, she said, I'd make sure that they had everything in their ball when they left. But she said, here was the most important thing I did when they left. I turned and I handed them their ball. Like, now, I did that in several ways. Some of them we shook hands. A lot of them I knew very well and I hugged them. But the point was I had this image of the ball transferring to the other person and them walking out with it because it's their world, it's their life. And the, in, in five minutes I'm going to open this other door and somebody else is going to be coming in with their problems. And I cannot be contaminated from the person I just dealt with if I'm going to deal effectively with this next person. And so when they sat down and discussed what they wanted to do, my gosh, so many people had adapted this skill that this woman used all along and no one even knew she had it because it never came up. But when they started to talk around ways to be able to let go of things quicker, be 100% with the person they're with, all of those kinds of things, they used a lot of her metaphor in that regard. All right, another one just came in, and this is probably a little bit more on the productivity side of things, which I know uh, you, you weren't entirely getting into at the beginning, um, but I think it relates. So I'm embarrassed to say that my biggest enemy in the workplace is my email inbox, where others seem to dictate my priorities and everything is urgent. Do you have any tips beyond shutting it down? Yeah, I, I think that at your high energy places in the day, the last thing you want to be doing is email. And so, you know, you. People work best, like multitasking doesn't work. Like I didn't touch on multitasking at all. I meant to, but I didn't. And I, I have a fun little thing I do with people to show them how ineffective multitasking is. And so, you know, you're working on a project and then you slip away to check the email because you heard it come in and then you go back to the project. The, the lost time and the refamiliarization with the project, it, it's, it's just such an inefficient way to work. And so my, my thing is, look, you know, you lay out the priorities before you get in there. What, what is my number one priority? Now, if it's to answer email, then you answer email. But if your number one priority is to do whatever it is, you know, then, then that's what you want to focus on. And I've had people even set a beeper on their watch. And I mean, like, for every 15 minutes. And the beeper goes off and they ask themselves, was I focused on this or did I get distracted by that? And over time, they got very good. Now. Listen, you will not focus on that project if you don't allocate a time to deal with things and, and to catch up with things and to deal with email. But slot them into a time slot and that's when you do it. And, and, but, but when I'm high energy and I've got enthusiasm, I will get a lot more done on this project than if I do a piece email, a piece email, a piece email. And organizations are, are, are going to have to start to recognize this because uh, it's true, we're working very inefficiently right now in many, many places. All right, uh, we have time, I think, for one more question. I know people are starting to drop off. Um, what would you say to someone if they get anxious in social situations, uh, let's say, for example, a business meeting, and is that the same type of thing that you would say to an Olympic athlete at the top of a mountain, or would things be different for getting anxious around a business meeting? Well, if they're getting anxious for the meeting, or, whether, or maybe they're getting anxious in the meeting when they get challenged or they get asked a question or things like that. And I would want them to start to mentally prepare for that. And the, and the, and the first thing I would ask them is, um, if someone said to me, well, you know, I'm, I'm a little anxious about the meeting, I'd say, okay, what else are you? And they would look at me very funny at that point, 
And I say, what else are you? What do you mean? Well, how confident are you? Oh, I'm very confident. Oh, how well do you express yourself? Well, I express myself very well. Okay. Um, how, how has uh, work been going? Oh, it's been going pretty well. Uh, well, oh, so work is going pretty well. You express yourself well. You're a competent human being. And you're a little anxious. You see? Because if we don't see the anxiousness for what it is, a small piece of the pie of who I am, then I become the anxiousness. And that's when you head into that um, chokers profile that we looked at earlier. And what happens in those situations, of course, you just validate it. That you realize, oh my God, I had something to be anxious for all along because the minute they challenged me, I was 100% so, caught up in my anxiousness. And so I didn't respond the way I knew. I, what I knew after the meeting, I couldn't get out in the meeting. And therefore, it validates it. So I think you've got to remember all of who you are. And then that's when you, you know, you're sitting there in the meeting and you notice your anxiousness rising. That's when you center. Nobody's even going to know you did it. But you, you have certain things you're doing to get yourself on track. And if you're generally an anxious person, take advantage of the EAP program again. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a trained counselor or a psychologist. I have a PhD in psychology, but I'm not a psychologist in the sense that I don't do counseling. I don't do therapy. But those people have a lot better maps for these kinds of things, uh, certainly, than, uh, than I have. All right. Um, I think we have, uh, we've had a number of questions as to what next. Uh, we do have a, uh, an executive education program uh, that we're running. It's a one-day session uh, working hand-in-hand you know, -hand with performance coaching. And we have dates of those upcoming February 26th and June 16th, 2015. And that'll be taking place at our Toronto uh, facility. We will have a survey that's going to pop up as soon as you close out of your survey window today that will ask if you want some more detail and some follow-up about that or a number of other programs that we run. Um, and I just, Peter, do you want to jump in with any details about this program? Well, it's the, it's the Inside Edge program. So you saw the model for that. It's the perspective, energy management, uh, imagery, and, uh, of course, the focus piece. And, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a terrific program. It's a one-day program. It's a self-assessment tool. It's, uh, it's, it's sports psychology applied to life. So for those who are saying, what next? <laughs> how do I get more That's of this? That's one possibility. This, this is a great option. And the next question that I've had a number of people ask, and I wanted to save this till the very end, because um, I know you probably won't want to give a huge pitch behind it, but uh, details about the book. When do you think it's going to be released? When are you hoping to finalize that title? And when can people expect to hear well, more? Well, that's, you know, once I get a title, the publisher's sitting there. Waiting. So it'll be out in four months if I come up with a title this week. And if I come up with a title next week, it'll be out in four months in a week. <laughs> i got to get a title for it. And I'm hoping somebody had a really nice brainy idea there that will send it to you, Neil, and uh, away we'll go. All right. So I think that's a great way to end things off today. Uh, <laughs> but please, please take, uh, take him at his word for that if you do have a, a great suggestion for a title. Oh, yeah. Yeah, re just simply respond to uh, the invitation that you got for today's webinar, and uh, we'll forward it along to Peter. We have uh, a, a number of resources that we're going to make available, including the breathing exercise on the website, and in addition to that, the recording will be posted early next week. So thank you all for your attendance and for your incredible questions today. Thank you, Peter, for your participation, and uh, have a great afternoon. And until the next month, we'll have a session next month on uh, managing a multi-generational workforce. So keep an eye on your email inbox for that invitation. So that's going to wrap things up today from Queens. Have a great day. Thank you.